Mr. McBride, the district superintendent of police, was the most reflective and best educated of the Chandrapur officials. He had read and thought a great deal, and owing to a somewhat unhappy marriage, had involved a complete philosophy of life. There was much of the cynic about him, but nothing of the bully. He never lost his temper or grew rough, and he received disease with courtesy. It was almost reassuring. I have to detain you until you get bail, he said. But no doubt your friends will be applying for it. And, of course, they'll be allowed to visit you under regulations. I'm given certain information and have to act on it. I'm not your judge. Aziz was led off, weeping. Mr. McBride set to work to draft his statement to the magistrate. He was interrupted by the arrival of Fielding. He imparted all he knew without reservations. Miss Derrick had herself driven in the car an hour ago. She and Miss Quest had both in a terrible state. They had gone straight to his bungalow, where he happened to be, and there and then he had taken down the charge and arranged for the arrest at the railway station. What is the charge, precisely? That he followed her into the cave and made insulting advances. She hit at him with her field glasses, he pulled at them and the strap broke, and that's how she got away. When we searched him just now, they were in his pocket. Oh, no. Oh, no. No. It'll be cleared up in five minutes, he cried again. Have a look at them. The strap had been newly broken. The eyepiece was jammed. The logic of evidence said guilty. Did she say any more? There was an echo that appears to have frightened her. Did you go into those caves? I saw one of them. There was an echo. Did it get on her nerves? I couldn't worry her over much with questions. She'll have plenty to go through in the witness box. They don't bear thinking about these next weeks. Yes, we start already. For a visiting card was brought. Vakil Mahmoud Ali, legal adviser to the prisoner, asked to be allowed to see him. McBride sighed, gave permission, and continued, I heard some more from Miss Derrick. She's an old friend of us both and talks freely. Well... Her account is that you went off to locate the camp, and almost at once she heard stones falling on the Kawadol and saw Miss Quested running straight down the face of a precipice. Well, she climbed up a sort of gully to her and found her practically done for. Her helmet off. Was a guide not with her? interrupted Fielding. No, she got among some cactuses. Miss Derrick saved her life coming just then. She was beginning to fling herself about. She helped her down to the car... And Miss Quest that couldn't stand the Indian driver cried, uh, keep him away. And it was that that put our friend on the track of what had happened. They made straight for our bungalow, and are they now? And that's the story, as far as I know it yet. She sent the driver to join you. I think she behaved with great sense. I suppose there's no possibility of my seeing Miss Quested. He asked suddenly. I hardly think that would do, surely. She's in no state to see anyone. And besides, you don't know her well. Hardly at all. But, you see, I believe she's under some hideous delusion. And that that wretched boy is innocent. The policeman started in surprise, and a shadow passed over his face. He could not bear his dispositions to be upset. I had no idea that was in your mind, he said, and looked for support at the signed deposition which lay before him. Another card was brought into the office. The barrister, Hamidullah's. The opposite army was gathering. I must put this report through now, Fielding. I wish you wouldn't. How can I not? I feel that things are rather unsatisfactory, as well as most disastrous. We are heading for a most awful smash. I can see your prisoner, I suppose. He hesitated. His own people seem in touch with him, all right. Well, when he's done with them. I wouldn't keep you waiting, good heavens. You take precedence of any Indian visitor, of course. I meant, what's the good? Why mix yourself up with pitch? I say he's innocent. Innocence or guilt? Why mix yourself up? What's the good? 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 He cried, feeling that every earth was being stopped. One's got to breathe occasionally. At least I have. I mayn't see her, now I mayn't see him. I promised him to come up here with him to you. 
A Turton called me off before I could get two steps. Sort of all right thing our collector would do, he muttered sentimentally. But we shall all have to hang together, old man, I'm afraid. I'm your junior in years, I know, but very much your senior in service. You don't happen to know this poisonous country as well as I do. And you must take it from me that the general situation is going to be nasty at Chandrapur during the next few weeks. Very nasty indeed. The man who doesn't toe the line is lost. I see what you mean. No, you don't see entirely. He not only loses himself, he weakens his friends. If you leave the line, you leave a gap in the line. These jackals, he pointed at the lawyer's cards, are looking with all their eyes for a gap. Can I visit Aziz, was his answer. No. You may see him on a matter of disorder, but on my own responsibility I don't feel justified. It might lead to more complications. Fielding left and returned to the college where he wrote a letter to Miss Quested. Even if it reached her, it would do no good, and probably the McBrides would withhold it. Miss Quested did pull him up short. She was such a dry, sensible girl, and quite without malice. The last person in Chandrapur wrongfully to accuse an Indian. Adela lay for several days in the McBride's bungalow. She had been touched by the sun. Also, hundreds of cactus spines had to be picked out of her flesh. Hour after hour, Miss Derrick and Mrs McBride examined her through magnifying glasses, always coming on fresh colonies, tiny hairs that might snap off and be drawn into the blood if they were neglected. No one understood her trouble, or knew why she vibrated between hard common sense and hysteria. She would begin a speech as if nothing particular had happened. I went into this detestable cave, she would say dryly, and I remember scratching the wall with my fingernail, to start the usual echo, and then, as I was saying, there was this shadow, or sort of shadow, down the entrance tunnel, bottling me up. It seemed like an age, but I suppose the whole thing can't have lasted 30 seconds, really. I hit at him with the glasses. He pulled me round the cave by the strap. It broke. I escaped. That's all. He never actually touched me once. Oh, it all seemed such nonsense. And then her eyes would fill with tears. Naturally, I'm, I'm upset, but I shall get over it. And then she would break down entirely and the women would feel she was one of themselves and cry too, and in the next room murmur, Good God! <gasps> Good God! Adela was always trying to think the incident out, always reminding herself that no harm had been done. It was the shock, but what is that? For a time her own logic would convince her. Then she would hear the echo again, weep, declare she was unworthy of Ronnie, and hope her assailant would get the maximum penalty. After one of these bouts, she longed to go out into the bazaars and ask pardon from everyone she met, for she felt in some vague way that she was leaving the world worse than she found it. She felt that it was her crime, until the intellect, reawakening, pointed out to her that she was inaccurate here, and set her again upon her sterile round. When the cactus thorns had all been extracted, and her temperature fallen to normal, Ronnie came to fetch her away. He was worn with indignation and suffering, and she wished she could comfort him. But intimacy seemed to caricature itself, and the more they spoke, the more wretched and self-conscious they became. Practical talk was the least painful, and he and McBride now told her one or two things which they had concealed from her during the crisis by the doctor's orders. She learned for the first time of the Moharam troubles. There had nearly been a riot. The last day of the festival, the great procession left its official route and tried to enter the civil station. And a telephone had been cut because it interrupted the advance of one of the larger paper towers. McBride and his police had pulled the thing straight, a fine piece of work. They passed on to another and very painful subject. The trial. She would have to appear in court identify the prisoner, and submit to cross-examination by an Indian lawyer. Can Mrs. Moore be with me, was all she said. 
Certainly, and I should be there myself, Ronnie replied. The case won't come before me. Oh, they've objected to me on personal grounds. It will be at Chandrapore. Oh, we thought at one time it would be transferred elsewhere. Miss Crested realises what all that means, though, said Bride sadly. The case will come before Das. Das was Ronnie's assistant. He was courteous and intelligent, and with the evidence before him could only come to one conclusion. But that he should be judge over an English girl had convulsed the station with wrath. And some of the women had sent a telegram about it to Lady Mellenby, the wife of the Lieutenant Governor. I must come before someone. That's, that's the way to face it. You have the pluck, Miss Crested. It only bothers us that we can't help you more. You're stopping here at such time. Is the greatest honour this house... He was overcome with emotion. By the way, uh, a letter came here while you were ill, he continued. I opened it, which is a strange confession to make. Will you forgive me? The circumstances are peculiar. It is from Fielding. Why should he write to me? A most lamentable thing has happened. The defence got hold of him. And he is now their mainstay, I needn't add. He is the one righteous Englishman in the horde of tyrants. He receives deputations from the bazaar, and they all chew betel nut and smear one another's hands with scent. It is not easy to enter into the mind of such a man. His students are on strike. Out of enthusiasm for him, they won't learn their lessons. If it weren't for Fielding, one would never have had the Moharam trouble. He has done a very grave disservice to the whole community. A letter lay here a day or two, waiting till you were well enough. Then the situation got so grave that I decided to open it in case it was useful to us. Is it? She said feebly. Not at all. He only has the impertinence to suggest that you have made a mistake. Would that I had. She glanced through the letter, which was careful and formal in its wording. Dr. Aziz is innocent, she read. Well, let's go. Let's go. Of course Mr. Fielding's letter doesn't count. He can think and write what he likes. I, I don't want your arm. I'm a magnificent walker. No, no, don't touch me, please. Mrs. McBride wished her an affectionate goodbye. A woman with whom she had nothing in common and whose intimacy oppressed her. Then Ronnie drove her back. It was early in the morning, for the day, as the hot weather advanced, swelled like a monster at both ends, and left less and less room for the movements of mortals. The house came in sight. It was a replica of the bungalow she had left. Puffy, red, and curiously severe, Mrs. Moore was revealed upon a sofa. She didn't get up when they entered, and the surprise of this roused Adela from her own troubles. Here you are, both back, was the only greeting. Adela sat down and took her hand. It withdrew, and she felt that, just as others repelled her, so did she repel Mrs. Moore. Are you all right? You appeared all right when I left, said Ronnie, trying not to speak crossly. But he had instructed her to give the girl a pleasant welcome, and he could not but feel annoyed. Oh, I'm all right, she said heavily. As a matter of fact, I have been looking at my return ticket. It is interchangeable, so I have a very much larger choice of boats home than I thought. We can go into that later, can't we? Ralph and Stella may be wanting to know when I arrive. <laughs> there is plenty of time for all such plans. How do you think our Adela looks? I'm counting on you to help me through. It is such a blessing to be with you again. Everyone else is a stranger, said the girl, rapidly. But Mrs. Moore showed no inclination to be helpful. A sort of resentment emanated from her. She seemed to say, am I to be bothered forever? Her Christian tenderness had gone, or had developed into a hardness, a just irritation against the human race. She had taken no interest at the arrest, asked scarcely any questions, and had refused to leave her bed on the awful night of Moharam, when an attack was expected on the bungalow. I know it's all nothing. I must be sensible. I do try, Adela continued, working again towards tears. I shouldn't mind if it had happened anywhere else. At least, 
I really don't know where it did happen. Ronnie supposed that he understood what she meant. She could not identify or describe the particular cave, indeed almost refused to have her mind cleared up about it, and it was recognised that the defence would try to make capital out of this during the trial. He reassured her. The Marabar caves were notoriously like one another. Indeed, in the future, they were to be numbered in sequence with white paint. Yes, I need that. At least, not exactly. But there is this echo that I keep on hearing. Oh, what of the echo? asked Mrs. Moore, paying attention to her for the first time. I can't get rid of it. I don't suppose you ever will. Ronnie had emphasised to his mother that Adela would arrive in a morbid state. Yet she was being positively malicious. Mrs. Moore, what is this echo? Don't you know? No. What is it? Oh, do say. I felt you would be able to explain it. This will comfort me so. Oh, if you don't know, you don't know. I can't tell you. I think you're rather unkind not to say. Say, 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 said the old lady bitterly, as if anything can be said. I've spent my life in saying or in listening to sayings. I've listened too much. It is time I was left in peace. Not to die, he added sourly. No doubt you expect me to die. When I have seen you and Ronnie married, and seen the other two, and whether they want to be married, I'll retire then into a cave of my own. She smiled, to bring down her remark into ordinary life, and thus add to its bitterness. Somewhere, where no young people will come asking questions and expecting answers, some shelf. Quite so, but meantime a trial is coming on, said her son hotly, and the notion of most of us is that we'd better pull together and help one another through instead of being disagreeable. Are you going to talk like that in the witness box? Oh, why should I be in the witness box? To confirm certain points in our evidence. I have... Nothing to do with your ludicrous law courts, she said, angry. I will not be dragged in at all. I won't have her dragged in either. I won't have any more trouble on my account, cried Adela, and again took the hand, which was again withdrawn. Her evidence is not the least essential. I shall attend your marriage, but not your trial, she informed them, tapping her knee. She had become very restless and rather ungraceful. Then, I shall go to England. You can't go to England in May, as you agreed. I have changed my mind. Well, we'd better end this unexpected wrangle, said the young man, striding about. You appear to be want to be left out of everything, and that's enough. My body, my miserable body, she sighed. Why isn't it strong? Well, why can't I walk away and be gone? Why can't I finish my duties and be gone? Why do I get headaches and puff when I walk? And all the time, this to do and that to do and this to do in your way and that to do in her way and everything, sympathy and confusion, bearing one another's burdens. Why can't this be done and that be done in my way and they be done and I at peace? Why is anything to be done? I cannot see. Why all this marriage? Marriage. The human race would have become a, a single person centuries ago if marriage was any use. And all this rubbish about love. Love in a church. Love in a cave. As if there's the least difference. And I held up from my business over such trifles. What do you want? He said, exasperated. Can you state it in simple language? If so, do. I want my pack of patience cards. Very well, get them. The poor girl was crying. Well, my dear girl, this isn't much of a homecoming. I had no idea she had this up her sleeve. Adela stopped crying. An extraordinary expression was on her face. Half relief, half horror. She repeated, As he is. I see. Have I made a mistake? You're overtired, 
he cried, not much surprised. Ronnie, suppose he's innocent, and I made an awful mistake. Well, sit down, anyhow. She obeyed and took hold of his hand. He stroked it, and she smiled, and gasped as if she had risen to the surface of the water, then touched her ear. My echo's better. That's good. You'll be perfectly well in a few days, but you must save yourself up for the trial. Das is a very good fellow. We shall all be with you. But Ronnie, dear Ronnie, perhaps there oughtn't to be any trial. I don't know quite what you're saying, and I don't think you do. If Dr. Aziz never did it, he ought to be let out. A shiver, like impending death, passed over Ronnie. Mrs. Moore came back with the same air of ill temper and sat down with a flump by the card table. Adela said, Oh, it would be so appalling if I was wrong. I should take my own life. He turned on her with, Now, come now. You know you're right, and the whole station knows it. Yes, he... This is very, very awful. I'm as certain as ever he followed me. Only wouldn't it be possible to withdraw the case? I dread the idea of giving evidence more and more. You're all so good to women here, and you have so much more power than in England. Oh, of course it's out of the question. I'm ashamed to have mentioned it. Please forgive me. That's all right, he said inadequately. Of course I forgive you, as you call it. But the case has come before a magistrate now. It really must. The machinery has started. She has started the machinery. It will work to its end. Adela inclined towards tears in consequence of this unkind remark. And Ronnie picked up the list of steamship sailings with an excellent notion in his head. His mother ought to leave India at once. She was doing no good to herself or to anyone else there. Lady Mellonby, wife to the Lieutenant Governor of the province, had been gratified by the appeal addressed to her by the ladies of Chandrapore. She could not do anything, besides she was sailing for England, but she desired to be informed if she could show sympathy in any other way. Mrs. Turton replied that Mr. Heslop's mother was trying to get a passage, but had delayed too long and all the boats were full. Could Lady Mellonby use her influence? Not even Lady Mellonby could expand the dimensions of a P&O, but she was a very, very nice woman, and she actually wired, offering the unknown and obscure old lady accommodation in her own reserved cabin. So Mrs. Moore had all she wished. She escaped the trial, the marriage, and the hot weather. She would return to England in comfort and distinction and see her other children. At her son's suggestion and by her own desire, she departed. But she accepted her good luck without enthusiasm. What had spoken to her in that scoured-out cavity of the granite? What dwelt in the first of the caves? Something very old and very small. Before time, it was before space also. Something snub-nosed, incapable of generosity. The undying worm itself. Since hearing its voice, she had not entertained one large thought. She was actually envious of Adela. All this fuss over a frightened girl. Nothing had happened. And if it had, she found herself thinking with the cynicism of a withered priestess, if it had, there are worse evils than love. Her son couldn't escort her to Bombay, for the local situation continued acute, and all officials had to remain at their posts. So she travelled with no one who could remind her of the past. This was a relief. The swift and comfortable mail train slid with her through the night, and all the next day she was rushing through central India, through landscapes that were baked and bleached, 
but had not the hopeless melancholy of the plain. She woke in the middle of the night with a start, for the train was falling over the western cliff. Moonlit pinnacles rushed up at her like the fringes of a sea. Then a brief episode of pain, the real sea, and the soupy dawn of Bombay. As she drove through the huge city which the West has built and abandoned with a gesture of despair, she longed to stop, though it was only Bombay, and disentangle the hundred Indias that passed each other in its streets. The feet of the horses moved her on, and presently the boat sailed, and thousands of coconut palms appeared all round the anchorage and climbed the hills to wave her farewell. So you thought an echo was India? You took the Marabar caves as final? They laughed. What have we in common with them? Goodbye. Then the steamer rounded Kalaba. The continent swung about. The cliff of the Ghats melted into the haze of a tropic sea. Lady Mellenby turned up and advised her not to stand in the heat. We are safely out of the frying pan, said Lady Mellenby. It will never do to fall into the fire. The court was crowded, and of course very hot, and the superintendent of police was opening the case for the prosecution. Mr McBride was not at pains to be an interesting speaker. He left eloquence to the defence who would require it. His attitude was, Everyone knows the man's guilty, and I am obliged to say so in public before he goes to the Andamans. Laboriously did he describe the genesis of the picnic. The prisoner had met Miss Quest at an entertainment given by the principal of Government College and had there conceived his intentions concerning her. Here, McBride paused, taking off his spectacles, as was his habit before enunciating a general truth. He looked into them sadly and remarked that the darker races are physically attracted by the fairer, but not vice versa. Not a matter for bitterness, this. Not a matter for abuse, but just a fact which any scientific observer will confirm. Even when the lady is so uglier than the gentleman! The comment fell from nowhere. From the ceiling, perhaps. It was the first interruption, and the magistrate felt bound to censure it. Turn that man out, he said. One of the native policemen took hold of a man who had said nothing and turned him out roughly. Mr. McBride resumed his spectacles and proceeded. But the comment had upset Miss Quested. Her body resented being called ugly and trembled. Do you feel faint, Adela? asked Miss Derrick, who tended her with loving indignation. I never feel anything else, Nancy. I shall get through, but it's awful. Awful. The superintendent trundled steadily forward. He produced a plan of the Marabar Hills, showing the route that the party had taken and the tank of the dagger where they had camped. Then an elevation of a specimen cave was produced, and he described what had occurred there. Then he spoke of Miss Derrick's arrival, of the scramble down the gully, of the return of the two ladies to Chandrapur, and of the document Miss Quest had signed on her arrival, in which mention was made of the field glasses. And then came the culminating evidence, the discovery of the field glasses on the prisoner. I have nothing to add at present, he concluded, moving his spectacles. I will now call my witnesses. The facts will speak for themselves. Uh, the prisoner is one of those individuals who have led a double life. I dare say his degeneracy gained upon him gradually. He has been very cunning at concealing, as is usual with the type, and pretending to be a respectable member of society, getting a government position even. He is now entirely vicious and beyond redemption, I'm afraid. He behaved most cruelly, most brutally, to another of his guests, another English lady. In order to get rid of her and leave him free for his crime, he crushed her into a cave among his servants. However, that is by the way. But his last words brought on another storm, and suddenly a new name, Mrs. Moore, burst on the court like a whirlwind. Aziza's barrister, Hamidullah, had been enraged. His nerves snapped. He shrieked like a maniac and asked whether his client was charged with murder as well as rape. And who was this second English lady? I don't propose to call her. You don't, because you can't. You are smuggled her out of the country. She's Mrs. Moore. You should have proved his innocence. She was on our side. She was poor Indian's friend. You could have called her yourself, cried the magistrate. Neither side called her. Neither must quote her as evidence. She was kept from us until too late. 
Hey, learn too late. This is English justice. Here is your British Raj. Give us back Mrs. Moore for five minutes only, and she will save my friend. And she will save the name of his sons. Don't rule her out, Mr. Das. Take back those words as you yourself are a father. Tell me where you have put her. Oh, Mrs. Moore! A tumult grew. An invocation of Mrs. Moore. People who did not know what the syllables meant repeated them like a charm. They became Indianized into Esmis Esmore. And they were taken up in the street outside. Esmis Esmore! Esmis Esmore! Esmis Esmore! Esmis Esmore! Ronnie? Yes, old girl? Isn't it all queer? I'm afraid it's very upsetting for you. Not the least. I don't mind it. Well, that's good. She had spoken more naturally and healthily than usual. Bending into the middle of her friends, she said, Don't worry about me. I'm much better than I was. I don't feel the least faint. I shall be all right. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your kindness. She had to shout her gratitude. But the chant, as miss, as more, went on. Suddenly it stopped. It was as if the prayer had been heard and the relics exhibited. When Adela came to give her evidence, the atmosphere was quieter than it had been since the beginning of the trial. Adela had always meant to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, and she'd rehearsed this as a difficult task. Difficult, because her disaster in the cave was connected, though by a thread, with another part of her life. Her engagement to Ronnie. She had thought of love just before she went in, and had innocently asked Aziz what marriage was like, and she supposed that her question had roused evil in him. To recount this would have been incredibly painful. It was the one point she wanted to keep obscure. But as soon as she rose to reply, and heard the sound of her own voice, she feared not even that. A new and unknown sensation protected her, like magnificent armour. She didn't think what had happened, but she returned to the Marabar Hills and spoke from them across a sort of darkness to Mr. McBride. Smoothly the voice in the distance proceeded, leading along the paths of truth. The prisoner and the guide took you on to the Cabadol, no one else being present. The most wonderfully shaped of those hills, yes. You went alone into one of those caves. That is quite correct. And uh, the prisoner followed you. Now we've got him from Major Callender. She was silent. The court, the place of question, awaited her reply. Uh, the prisoner followed you, didn't he? He repeated in the monotonous tones that they both used. They were employing agreed words throughout, so that this part of the proceedings held no surprises. May I have half a minute before I reply to that, Mr. McBride? Certainly. Her vision was of several caves. She saw herself in one, and she was also outside it. Watching its entrance for Aziz to pass in, she failed to locate him. It was the doubt that had often visited her, but solid and attractive like the hills. I am not... Speech was more difficult than vision. I am not quite sure. I beg your pardon, said the superintendent of police. I, I cannot be sure. I, I didn't catch that answer. He looked scared. His mouth shut with a snap. You're on that landing, or whatever we term it, and you have entered a cave. I suggest to you that the prisoner followed you. She shook her head. What do you mean, please? No, she said in a flat, unattractive voice. Slight noises began in various parts of the room, but no one yet understood what was occurring except Fielding. He saw that she was going to have a nervous breakdown and that his friend was saved. What is that? What are you saying? Speak up, please. The magistrate bent forward. I'm afraid I have made a mistake. What nature of mistake? Dr. Aziz never followed me into the cave. The superintendent slammed down his papers 
then picked them up and said calmly, Now, oh, Miss Quested, let us go on. Uh, I will read you the words of the deposition which you signed two hours later in my bungalow. Excuse me, Mr. McBride, but you cannot go on. I am speaking to the witness myself, and the public will be silent. If it continues to talk, I will have the court cleared. Miss Quested, address your remarks to me, who am the magistrate in charge of the case, and realize their extreme gravity. Remember, you speak on oath, Miss Quested. Dr. Aziz, never... I stop these proceedings on medical grounds, cried the Major on a word from Turton, and all the English rose from their chairs at once, large white figures behind which the little magistrate was hidden. The Indians rose too. Hundreds of things went on at once, so that afterwards each person gave a different account of the catastrophe. You withdraw the charge! Answer me! shrieked the representative of justice. Something that she did not understand took hold of the girl and pulled her through. It was in hard, prosaic tones that she said, I withdraw everything. Enough! Sit down! Mr. McBride, do you wish to continue in the face of this? The superintendent gazed at his witness as if she was a broken machine and said, Are you mad? Don't question her, sir! You have no longer the right! Give me time to consider. Saib, you'll have to withdraw. This becomes a scandal, boomed a voice suddenly from the back of the court. He shall not, shouted Mrs. Turton against the gathering tumult. Call the other witnesses. We're none of us safe. Ronnie tried to check her, but she gave him an irritable blow, then screamed insults at Adela. The superintendent moved to the support of his friend, saying nonchalantly to the magistrate as he did so, right, I withdraw. Mr. Das rose, nearly dead with the strain. He had controlled the case, just controlled it. He had shown that an Indian can preside. To those who could hear him, he said, The prisoner is released without one stain on his character. The question of costs will be decided elsewhere. And then the flimsy framework of the court broke up. The shouts of derision and rage culminated. People screamed and cursed, kissed one another, wept passionately. Here were the English whom their servants protected. There Aziz fainted in Hamadullah's arms. Victory on this side, defeat on that. Complete for one moment was the antithesis. Then life returned to its complexities. Person after person struggled out of the room to their varied purposes. And before long, no one remained on the scene of the fantasy. Miss Quested had renounced her own people. Turning from them, she was drawn into a mass of Indians of the shopkeeping class and carried by them towards the public exit of the court. There she was flung against Mr. Fielding. What do you want here? Knowing him for her enemy, she passed on into the sunlight without speaking. He called after her. Where are you going, Miss Quested? I don't know. You can't wander about like that. Where's the car you came in? I shall walk. Oh, what madness. There's supposed to be a riot on. The police have struck. No one knows what'll happen next. Come this way with me, quick. I'll put you into my carriage. The Victoria was safe in a quiet side lane. But there were no horses. For the Sayers, not expecting the trial would end so abruptly, had led them away to visit a friend. She got into it obediently. The man could not leave her, for the confusion increased and spots of it sounded fanatical. What... what have you been doing? he cried suddenly. Playing a game? Studying life or what? Sir, I intend these for you, sir! interrupted a student, running down the lane with a garland of jasmine on his arm. I don't want the rubbish. Get out! 
Sir, I am a horse. We shall be your horses. Another cried as he lifted the shafts of the Victoria into the air. Hurry up, sir! We pull you in a procession! And half affectionate, half impudent, they bundled him in. Where was the procession going? To friends? To enemies? To Aziz's bungalow? Or to the collector's bungalow? To the Minto hospital where the civil surgeon would eat dust and the patients, confused with prisoners, be released? To Delhi? Simla? The students thought it was going to government college. Fielding took the refugee to his office and tried to telephone to McBride. But this he could not do. The wires had been cut. All his servants had decamped. Once more he was unable to desert her. He assigned her a couple of rooms, provided her with ice and drinks and biscuits, advised her to lie down, and lay down himself. There was nothing else to do. He felt restless and thwarted as he listened to the retreating sounds of the procession, and his joy was rather spoilt by bewilderment. It was a victory, but such a queer one. Evening approached by the time Fielding and Miss Quest had met and had the first of their numerous curious conversations. He had hoped when he woke up to find someone had fetched her away, but the college remained isolated from the rest of the universe. She asked whether she could have a sort of interview, and when he made no reply, said, Have you any explanation of my extraordinary behaviour? None, he said curtly. Why make such a charge if you were going to withdraw it? Why, indeed. I ought to feel grateful to you, I suppose, but I, I, I don't expect gratitude. I only thought you might care to hear what I have to say. Oh, well, he grumbled, feeling rather schoolboyish. I don't think a discussion between us is desirable. To put it frankly, I belong to the other side in this ghastly affair. Would it not interest you to hear my side? Not much. I shouldn't tell you in confidence, of course, so you can hand on all my remarks to your side. But there is one great mercy that has come out of all today's misery. I have no longer any secrets. My echo has gone. I call the buzzing sound in my ears an echo. You see, I have been unwell ever since that expedition to the caves, and possibly before it. The remark interested him rather. It was what he had sometimes suspected himself. What kind of illness? he inquired. She touched her head at the side, then shook it. That was my first thought the day of the arrest. Hallucination. Do you think that could be so? she asked with great humility. What should have given me an hallucination? One of three things certainly happened in the Malabar, he said, getting drawn into a discussion against his will. One of four things. Either Aziz is guilty, which is what your friends think, or you invented the charge out of malice, which is what my friends think, or you've had an hallucination. I'm very much inclined, getting up and striding about, now that you tell me that you felt unwell before the expedition, it's an important piece of evidence. I believe that you yourself broke the strap of the field glasses. You were alone in that cave the whole time. Perhaps. I was watching you carefully through your evidence this morning, and if I'm right, the hallucination disappeared suddenly. She tried to remember what she had felt in court, but could not. The vision disappeared whenever she wished to interpret it. Events presented themselves to me in their logical sequence was what she said. But it hadn't been that at all. My belief, and of course I was listening carefully and hoped you would make some slip, my belief is that poor McBride exorcised you. As soon as he asked you a straightforward question, you gave a straightforward answer and broke down. Perhaps, she said again, but let me conclude my analysis. We are agreed that he is not a villain and that you are not one, and we aren't really sure that it was an hallucination. There's a fourth possibility which we must touch on. Was it somebody else? The guide? Exactly. The guide? I often think so. Unluckily, Aziz hit him on the face and he got a fright and disappeared. It is most unsatisfactory. We hadn't the police to help us. The guide was of no interest to them. Perhaps it was the guide, she said quietly. 
The question had lost interest for her suddenly. That moment, Hamidullah joined them, and seemed not too pleased to find them closeted together. Like everyone else in Chandrapur, he could make nothing of Miss Quester's conduct. He had overheard their last remarks. Hello, my dear Fielding, he said. So I run you down at last. Can you come out at once to Dilkusha for our celebration? At once? Oh, I hope to leave in a moment. Don't let me interrupt, said Adela. The telephone has been broken. Miss Quested can't ring up her friends, he explained. A great deal has been broken. More than will ever be mended, said the other. Still, there should be some way of transporting this lady back to the civil lines. The resources of civilization are numerous. He spoke without looking at Miss Quested, and he ignored the slight movement she made towards him with her hand. I have settled my movements, said Miss Quested. I shall go to the Dak bungalow. Not the Turtons? said Hamidullah, goggle-eyed. I thought you were their guest. The Dak bungalow of Chandrapur was below the average, and certainly servantless. The collector would take me in, I know, but Mrs. Turton said this morning that she would never see me again. She spoke without bitterness or, as Hamidullah thought, without proper pride. Her aim was to cause the minimum of annoyance. Far better stop here than expose yourself to insults from that preposterous woman. Do you find her preposterous? I used to. I don't know. Well, here's our solution, said the barrister, who had strolled to the window. Here comes the city magistrate. At last! said Adela sharply, which caused Fielding to glance at her. He comes, he comes, he comes. I cringe, I tremble. Will you ask him what he wants, Mr. Fielding? He wants you, of course. He may not even know I'm here. I'll see him first, if you prefer. When he had gone, Hamidullah said to her bitingly, Really, really, need you have exposed Mr. Fielding to this further discomfort? Uh, he's far too considerate. She made no reply, and there was complete silence between them until their host returned. He has some news for you, he said. You'll find him on the veranda. He prefers not to come in. She said a few words of thanks to the principal for his kindness to her during the day. Thank goodness that's over, he remarked, not escorting her to the veranda, for he held it unnecessary to see Ronnie again. It was insulting of him not to come in. He couldn't very well after my behaviour. Heslop doesn't come out badly. Besides, fate has treated him pretty roughly today. He's had a cable to the effect that his mother's dead. Poor old soul. Oh, really? This is more. I'm sorry, said Hamidullah, rather indifferently. She died at sea. In the heat, I suppose. Mm, presumably. May is no month to allow an old lady to travel in. Mm, quite so. Heslop ought never to have let her go, and he knows it. Shall we be off? The other smiled and looked at his watch. They both regretted the death, but they were middle-aged men who had invested their emotions elsewhere, and outbursts of grief could not be expected from them over a slight acquaintance. Oh, this is unbearable, muttered Hamidullah. Miss Quested was back again. Mr. Fielding, has Ronnie told you of this new misfortune? He bowed. Ah, me. She sat down and seemed to stiffen into a monument. Heslop is waiting for you, I think. I do so long to be alone. She was my best friend, far more to me than to him. I can't bear to be with Ronnie. Can't explain. Could you do me the very great kindness of letting me stop after all? Hamidullah swore violently in the vernacular. I should be pleased. But does Mr. Heslop wish it? I didn't ask him. We are too much upset. It's so complex. Not like what unhappiness is supposed to be. Each of us ought to be alone and think... Oh, do come and see Ronnie again. I think he should come in this time, said Fielding, feeling that this much was due to his own dignity. 
Do ask him to come. She returned with him. He was half miserable, half arrogant, indeed a strange mix-up, and broke at once into uneven speech. I came to bring Miss Quested away, but her visit to the Turtons has ended, and there is no other arrangement so far. Mine are bachelor quarters now. Fielding stopped him courteously. Say no more. Miss Quested stops here. I only wanted to be assured of your approval. Hamidullah remained silent, while the details of Miss Quested's occupation at the college were arranged, merely remarking to Ronnie, It is clearly to be understood, sir, that neither Mr. Fielding nor any of us are responsible for this lady's safety at Government College. To which Ronnie agreed. After that, he watched the semi-chivalrous behavings of the three English with quiet amusement. He thought Fielding had been incredibly silly and weak, and he was amazed by the younger people's want of proper pride. When they were driving out to Dilkusha, hours later, he said, I have been considering what sum Miss Quested ought to pay as compensation. And, said Fielding, twenty thousand rupees. No more was then said, but the remark horrified Fielding. Mrs. Moore was dead, committed to the deep while still on the southward track, for the boats from Bombay cannot point towards Europe until Arabia has been rounded. She was further in the tropics than she ever achieved while on shore, when the sun touched her for the last time and her body was lowered into yet another India, the Indian Ocean. Ronnie reminded himself that his mother had left India at her own wish, but his conscience was not clear. He had behaved badly to her, and he had either to repent, which involved a mental overturn, or to persist in unkindness towards her. He chose the latter course. How tiresome she had been with her patronage of Aziz. What a bad influence upon Adela. Adela. She would have to depart too. He hoped she would have made the suggestion herself ere now. He really could not marry her. It would mean the end of his career. Poor, lamentable Adela. She remained at Government College by Fielding's courtesy. Unsuitable and humiliating, but no one would receive her at the civil station. He postponed all private talk until the award against her was decided. Aziz was suing her for damages in the sub-judge's court, then he would ask her to release him. She had killed his love, and it had never been very robust. She belonged to the callow academic period of his life, which he had outgrown. Grasmere, serious talks and walks, that sort of thing. Fielding found himself drawn more and more into Miss Quested's affairs. The college remained closed, and he ate and slept at Hamidullah's so there was no reason she should not stop on if she wished. In her place, he would have cleared out, sooner than submit to Ronnie's half-hearted and distracted civilities. But she was waiting for the hourglass of her sojourn to run through. A house to live in, a garden to walk in during the brief moment of the cool. That was all she asked, and he was able to provide them. Disaster had shown her her limitations, and he realised now what a fine, loyal character she was, her humility was touching. She never repined at getting the worst of both worlds. She regarded it as the due punishment of her stupidity. His Indian friends were, on the other hand, a bit above themselves. Aziz was friendly and domineering. He wanted Fielding to give in to the East, as he called it, and live in a condition of affectionate dependence upon it. You can trust me, Cyril. No question of that. And Fielding had no roots among his own people. Yet he really couldn't become a sort of Mohammed Latif. When they argued about it, something racial intruded, not bitterly, but inevitably, like the colour of their skins. Coffee colour versus pink or grey. And Aziz would conclude, Can't you see that I'm grateful to you for your help and want to reward you? And the other would retort, If you want to reward me, let Miss Quested off paying. The insensitiveness about Adela displeased him. It would, from every point of view, be right to treat her generously, 
and he had the notion of appealing to the memory of Mrs. Moore. Aziz had this high and fantastic estimate of Mrs. Moore. Her death had been a real grief to his warm heart. He wept like a child and ordered his three children to weep also. There was no doubt that he respected and loved her. Fielding was not ashamed to practice a little necromancy. Whenever the question of compensation came up, he introduced the dead woman's name. He raised a questionable image of her in the heart of Aziz, saying nothing that he believed to be untrue, but producing something that was probably far from the truth. Aziz yielded suddenly. He felt it was Mrs. Moore's wish that he should spare the woman who was about to marry her son, that it was the only honour he could pay her, and he renounced with a passionate and beautiful outburst the whole of the compensation money, claiming only costs. It was fine of him, but it won him no credit with the English. They still believed he was guilty. They believed it to the end of their careers, and retired Anglo-Indians in Tunbridge Wells or Cheltenham still murmur to each other. That Malabar case, which broke down because the poor girl couldn't face giving her evidence, <laughs> that was another bad case. When the affair was thus officially ended, Ronnie, who was about to be transferred to another part of the province, approached Fielding with his usual constraint and said, I wish to thank you for the help you've given Miss Crested. She will not, of course, trespass on your hospitality further. Uh, she has, as a matter of fact, decided to return to England. I have just arranged about her passage for her. Uh, I understand she would like to see you. I shall go round at once. On reaching the college, he found her in some upset. He learned that the engagement had been broken by Ronnie. Far wiser of him, she said pathetically. I ought to have spoken myself, but I, I drifted on, wondering what would happen. I would willingly have gone on spoiling his life through inertia. One has nothing to do. One belongs nowhere and becomes a public nuisance without realising it. In order to reassure him, she added, I speak only of India. I'm not astray in England. I fit in there. No, don't think I shall do harm in England. When I am forced back there, I shall settle down to some career. I have sufficient money left to start myself, and heaps of friends of my own type. I shall be quite all right. Then, sighing, but, oh, the trouble I've brought on everyone here. I can never get over it. We ought never to have thought of marriage. Weren't you amazed when our engagement was originally announced? Not much. At my age, one's seldom amazed, he said, smiling. And about marriage, I am cynical. I am not. This false start has been all my own fault. I was bringing to Ronnie nothing that ought to be brought. That was why he rejected me, really. I entered that cave thinking, am I fond of him? I have not yet told you that, Mr. Fielding. Uh, I didn't feel justified. Tenderness, respect, personal intercourse. I tried to make them take the place of... I no longer want love, he said, supplying the word. No more do I. My experiences here have cured me, but I want others to want it. Write to me when you get to England. I shall, often. You have been excessively kind. Now that I'm going, I realise it. I wish I could do something for you in return, but I see you've all you want. I think so, he replied after a pause. I have never felt more happy and secure out here. I really do get on with Indians, and they do trust me. It's pleasant that I haven't had to resign my job. Until the next earthquake, I remain as I am. Of course, this death has been troubling me. Aziz was so fond of her, too. A friendliness, as of dwarfs shaking hands, was in the air. Both man and woman were at the height of their powers, sensible, honest, even subtle. They spoke the same language and held the same opinions, and the variety of age and sex did not divide them. Yet, they were dissatisfied. When they spoke, the words were followed by a curious backwash, as though the universe had displaced itself to fill up a tiny void, or as though they had seen their own gestures from an immense height. Dwarves talking, shaking hands and assuring each other that they stood on the same footing of insight. They did not think they were wrong, because as soon as honest people think they are wrong, instability sets up. Not for them was an infinite goal behind the stars, and they never sought it. But wistfulness descended on them now, as on other occasions. 
The shadow of the shadow of a dream fell over their clear-cut interests, and objects never seen again seemed messages from another world. And I do like you so very much, if I may say so, he affirmed. I'm glad, for I like you. Let's meet again. We will, in England, if I ever take home leave. But I suppose you're not likely to do that yet. Quite a chance. I have a scheme on now, as a matter of fact. Oh, that would be very nice. So it petered out. Ten days later, Adela went off by the same route as her dead friend. The final beat-up before the monsoon had come. The country was stricken and blurred. Its houses, trees and fields were all mottled out of the same brown paste. And the sea at Bombay slid about like broth against the keys. Her last Indian adventure was with Antony, who followed her onto the boat and tried to blackmail her. She had been Mr. Fielding's mistress, Antony said. Perhaps Antony was discontented with his tip. She rang the cabin bell and had him turned out. But his statement created rather a scandal, and people did not speak to her much during the first part of the voyage. Through the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea she was left to herself, and to the dregs of Chandrapore. Aziz had no sense of evidence. The sequence of his emotions decided his beliefs, and led to the tragic coolness between himself and his English friend. They had conquered, but were not to be crowned. Fielding was away at a conference, and after the rumour about his relationship to Miss Quest had been with him undisturbed for a few days, he assumed it was true. He had no objection on moral grounds to his friends amusing themselves, and Cyril, being middle-aged, could no longer expect the pick of the female market, and must take his amusement where he could find it. But he resented him making up to this particular woman, whom he still regarded as his enemy. Also, why had he not been told? What is friendship without confidence? He himself had told things sometimes regarded as shocking, and the Englishman had listened, tolerant, but surrendering nothing in return. He met Fielding at the railway station on his return, went to dine with him, and then started taxing him by the oblique method, outwardly merry. Look here, Cyril, while I remember it, there's some gossip about you. They say that you and Miss Quested became also rather too intimate friends. To speak perfectly frankly, they say you and she have been guilty of impropriety. <laughs> they would say that. It's all over the town and may injure your reputation. You know, everyone is by no means your supporter. I have tried all I could to silence such a story. Oh, don't bother. Miss Quested has cleared out at last. It is those who stop in the country, not those who leave it whom such a story injures. Imagine my dismay and anxiety. I could scarcely get a wink of sleep. First my name was coupled with her, and now it is yours. Don't use such exaggerated phrases. As what? As dismay and anxiety. Have I not lived all my life in India? Do I not know what produces a bad impression here? His voice shot up rather crossly. Yes, but the scale... The scale, you always get the scale wrong, my dear fellow. A pity there is this rumour, but such a very small pity. So small that we may as well talk of something else. You mind for a misquested sake, though, I can see from your face. As far as I do mind, I travel light. Cyril, that boastfulness about travelling light will be your ruin. It is raising up enemies against you on all sides. It makes me feel excessively uneasy. What enemies? Since Aziz had only himself in mind, he could not reply. Presently, he said, So you and Madame Adela used to amuse one another in the evening. Naughty boy. Those drab and high-minded talks had scarcely made for dalliance. Fielding was so startled at the story being taken seriously, and so disliked being called a naughty boy, that he lost his head and cried, Oh, you little rotter! Well, I'm damned! Amusement, indeed. Is it likely at such a time? Oh, I beg your pardon, I'm sure. The licentious oriental imagination was at work, he replied, speaking gaily, but cut to the heart. For hours after his mistake, he bled inwardly. You see, Aziz, the circumstances. Also, the girl was still engaged to Heslop. Also, I never felt... Yes, yes, but you didn't contradict what I said, so I thought it was true. 
Oh dear, east and west, most misleading. You're not offended. Most certainly I am not. If you are, this must be cleared up later on. It has been, he answered, dignified. I believe absolutely what you say, and of that there need be no further question. But the way I said it must be cleared up. I was unintentionally rude. Unreserved regrets. The fault is entirely mine. Tangles like this still interrupted their intercourse. A pause in the wrong place, an intonation misunderstood, and a whole conversation went awry. Fielding changed the subject. I'm going quite soon to England, he said. I thought you might end in England, Aziz said very quietly. I'm only going for a little time, on official business. My service is anxious to get me away from Chandrapur for a bit. It is obliged to value me highly, but does not care for me. The situation is somewhat humorous. What is the nature of the business? Would it leave you much spare time? Enough to see my friends. I expected you to make such a reply. You are a faithful friend. I suppose you will visit Miss Quested. If I have time. It would be strange seeing her in Hampstead. What is Hampstead? Um, an artistic and thoughtful little suburb of London. And there she lives in comfort. You will enjoy seeing her. Dear me, I've got a headache this evening. Perhaps I'm going to have cholera. With your permission, I'll leave early. When would you like the carriage? Don't trouble, I'll bike. But you haven't got your bicycle. My carriage fetched you. Let it take you away. Sound reasoning, he said, trying to be gay. I have not got my bicycle. But I am seen too often in your carriage. I am taught to take advantage of your generosity. He was out of sorts and uneasy. The conversation jumped from topic to topic in a broken-backed fashion. They were affectionate and intimate, but nothing clicked tight. Aziz, you have forgiven me the stupid remark I made. When you called me a little rotter? Yes, to my eternal confusion. You know how fond I am of you. That is nothing, of course. We all of us make mistakes. In a friendship such as ours, a few slips are of no consequence. But as he drove off, something depressed him. A dull pain of body or mind, waiting to rise to the surface. On the day before Fielding was due to leave, Aziz and he went for a last ride together. All the way they wrangled about politics. Each had hardened, and a good knockabout proved enjoyable. They trusted each other, although they were going to part, perhaps because they were going to part. Fielding had no further use for politeness, he said, meaning that the British Empire really can't be abolished because it's rude. Aziz retorted, Very well, and we have no use for you and glared at him with abstract hate. He cried, Clear out, all you Turtons and Burtons! We wanted to know you ten years back. Now it's too late. If we see you and sit on your committees, it's for political reasons. Don't you make any mistake. His horse reared. Clear out! Clear out, I say! Why are we put to so much suffering? We used to blame you. Now we blame ourselves. We grow wiser. Until England is in difficulties, we keep silent. But in the next European war, ah, aha, then is our time. India shall be a nation. No foreigners of any sort. Hindu and Muslim and Sikh and all shall be one. Hooray! Hooray for India! Hooray! Hooray! India a nation. What an apotheosis. Last comer to the drab 19th century sisterhood. Waddling in at this hour of the world to take her seat. She, whose only peer was the Holy Roman Empire. She shall rank with Guatemala and Belgium, perhaps. Fielding mocked again. And Aziz, in an awful rage, danced this way and that, not knowing what to do, and cried, Down with the English, anyhow, that's certain. Clear out, you fellows, double quick, I say. We may hate one another, but we hate you most. And if I don't make you go, my sons will. If it's fifty or five hundred years, we shall get rid of you. Yes, we shall drive every blasted Englishman into the sea. And then... He rode against him furiously. And then... He concluded, half-kissing him. You and I shall be friends. Why can't we be friends now? Said the other, holding him affectionately. 
It's what I want. It's what you want. But the horses didn't want it. They swerved apart. The earth didn't want it, sending up rocks through which riders must pass single file. The temples, the tank, the jail, the birds, the carrion, they didn't want it. They said in their hundred voices, no, not yet. And the sky said, no, not there. <laughs>